And um, I always like to begin with a few, little bit of information about Don Yoder. Uh, Don Yoder is, uh, I believe, 84 years old. And naturally, what would an 84-year-old be doing but in Germany? And he's running around Germany as a guest of the German government. And he's brought various artisans with him from, of the Pennsylvania Germans. And he's doing talks and lectures over there. And next fall, Don is sponsoring uh, an international conference in Philadelphia, which is on the topic ephemera across the Atlantic. And that will take place from the 15th of September through the 17th of September, 2005. And it is jointly sponsored by the Library Company of Philadelphia and the Winterthur Museum. It will involve three days of papers and a final day of um, a trip to the countryside, uh, led by Don Yoder. Diane, can you imagine that? And we've done that one right. And so he will lead, he will lead an excursion on the last day into Pennsylvania Dutch country and look at various museums and other sites. Now that alone is worth the trip to Philadelphia to be with Don Yoder when he's running around Pennsylvania Dutch country. So he is, uh, I always like to say, this is not the Don Yoder Memorial Lecture, because Don Yoder is alive and well and continuing with his work, continuing to write and to publish books. Uh, he recently had a book come out on the history of the groundhog that I know you all want to run out and buy. And uh, he is. A for for <laughs> Did he write a review for JF? I have it, and I need oh. That's a very good, that's a very good, I mean, I, I, I've seen the book and it certainly is a fun book. <laughs> so Don, uh, this, this lecture is uh, certainly done with uh, a love and affection to Don, and there's nothing better than talking about religion in everyday life, and certainly uh, talking about religion in Europe, which is a subject that he loved in his many years of scholarship and teaching. And our guest is uh, Dr. Marion Bowman, who is uh, uh, one of Europe's finest scholars of, of vernacular religion. Uh, her work, at least her work, as the work of hers that I have known, has been on contemporary Celtic spirituality in the UK, uh, on New Age religion and alternative spirituality, including over 10 years of ethnographic work in Glastonbury. Um, of course, also, I think of her article on the mourning surrounding of the death of Princess Diana in England. And she really has been championing the study of vernacular religion within mainstream religious studies in the, in the United Kingdom uh, throughout her career. She is, uh, at this time, the president of the Folklore Society, and she's also the senior lecturer at the Open University. Uh, she's also, she also gives one great tour of Stonehenge, I have to tell you that. <laughs> um, she is this year's uh, Don Yoder lecturer, and I really uh, thank her for coming all the way here, and um, I uh, am very happy and honored to introduce her to you, Dr. Mary Bowman. for inviting me to give this year's Don Yoda Lecture in Religious Folk Life. It's an immense honour, and I rank the writings of Don Yoder alongside the teaching of Herbert Halpert as among the greatest influences on my academic interest in folk religion. And I'm also absolutely thrilled to be here during the final year of my presidency of the Folklore Society, so thank you very much. Now, what I want to present here is very much work in progress, which may be foolish under the circumstances, but I'm so excited by it that when we were discussing topics, Leonard thought we should go with this, and so here we are. Uh, so I've just really started this work relating to airport chapels and chaplaincy. And at this stage, I'm at the start of my field work, and I've confined my investigations largely to UK airports and two significant hub airports on the European mainland, Amsterdam in Holland and Brussels in Belgium. Now, as I'm discovering, the wonderful world of airport chaplaincy throws up a whole host of fascinating issues, an interesting range of duties and expectations of chaplains, some 
explicit and implicit issues concerning perceptions and representations of religion and negotiations between religions. And I think also some amazing examples of material culture. Given this conference's theme, as we've been urged to explore literal and symbolic understandings of space and place, I want to start by looking at airports as liminal spaces. Then, in the context of religious folk life, I'll concentrate on the creation, marking, and negotiation of sacred space in four airports, and some of the many issues implicitly and explicitly involved in that. Each place, each airport, has a story, and I'm shamelessly going to privilege telling the stories over following every analytical avenue that could be pursued in relation to them. For that way, I can present more of the actual material, and I think that will be the best use of the time available. So let's start by thinking about religion and travel. Well, of course, religion traditionally has been one of the major motivators for travel to local or national shrines, to Rome, Jerusalem, Mecca, Varanasi, Amritsar, Bodh Gaya, or wherever. There has also long been the assumption that when people travel, they are likely to turn to religion, having need of spiritual comfort and physical protection. Numerous wayside shrines and chapels were established, especially along well-trodden pilgrimage routes, to satisfy the traveler's spiritual needs. And of course, in the Christian tradition, there was St. Christopher, whose special remit was to look after travelers, and in particular, to protect them from sudden death. And it's really rather touching, I think, that the ecumenical airport chapel at Munich, opened in 1992, is dedicated to St. Christopher, despite his official fall from grace. So let's talk liminal. I think it's reasonable to regard the airport as a liminal place and air travel as having some resonance with the, liminal, the liminality traditionally associated with rites of passage. Of course, those who travel to Mecca to go on Hajj are literally taking part in a rite of passage and will return from their journey with their status changed. And about over 20,000 Muslims from Britain, for example, go each year to Mecca for the Hajj. For the majority, though, there will be no overt religious aspect to their journey, and air travel is becoming so commonplace that perhaps it can't necessarily be considered a rite of passage, though who can forget that first sensation of defying gravity and getting above the clouds? I still get a buzz from it. But travel can be seen as liminal experience in that it takes you outside your normal social, geographical, cultural, and linguistic surroundings. As one chaplain put it, people are away from their roots when they are in transit. Moreover, air travelers in particular are often in similar physical states to those described in connection with ritual, namely exhausted, disoriented, and vulnerable. Tired and tetchy, travelers often feel anxious, whether through fear of flying or simply because they're in Paris and their baggage is in Rome. <laughs> Airports are, in some respects, liminal spaces. They are in a place, but once through the barrier, through customs or whatever, you are no longer entirely in that place. And this was really demonstrated for me by seeing people at Heathrow Airport changing into their Hajj clothes in the departure lounge. They had very clearly understood that they were now in a transitional state, in a transitional place, no longer at home, and were starting to mark that separation. And that liminality is particularly true of airports that function as hubs, for they are neither point of departure nor destination. They are liminal spaces to be passed through in order to achieve one's goal. They are literally neither here nor there. And your experience of flying, of airports, and I suggest of airport chapels, will differ if you are used to going directly from A to B or whether you have to go via. And remember, long distance and budget travel often involves changes of flights and much transiting. 
Now, the weariness and inevitability of transiting was summed up by a comment I heard on the radio by an American who lives in the southern United States complaining that whenever he goes and wherever he goes, he has to transit through Atlanta. He said, when southerners die, whether they're bound for heaven or the other place, chances are they'll have to travel through Atlanta. <laughs> There's also a sort of temporal liminality which I find fascinating and I don't have time to talk about here. This idea of people being outside normal time as well as being outside normal space. And this is expressed in entries in visitors books in airport chapels. When people engage in dialogue with travelers who have already passed through. And let me just give you an example from the Protestant chapel visitors book in Amsterdam. First comment. How will I know when and if God has forgiven me? Next comment, some days later, different writing. Because Jesus has taken the punishment you deserved when he died on the cross. Next comment, some days later. It is forgiven on the instant. You are the one with the problem, not God. When will you forgive yourself? And so on. And I, this is not uncommon. I've encountered this in various uh, airport visitors books, airport chapels visitors books. So there's a lot to unpack there. But I'd like to move on to look specifically at some of the sacred spaces constructed in these liminal places. One reason I got hooked on airport chapels is that I have a great personal interest in architecture and the manipulation of space. So here I want to explore the way sacred space is negotiated within airports, including where the impulse to have a chapel comes from, where the chapel is situated both physically and metaphorically in the life of the airport, the extent to which the chapel is rooted in local or national culture, and whether the airport chapel celebrates, accentuates, or even acknowledges that it's in an airport context. And I should just say that I'm using chapel here as a generic term because such spaces are given a variety of names, and that's a point that I'll return to later. But before we go any further, how many of you flew to get here? Right. How many of you noticed signs for an airport chapel? Okay. Okay. How many of you visited an airport chapel? <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, well, this will help you in the future. <laughs> Look for the little kneeling figure. This is the logo of the International Association of Civil Aviation Chaplains, known in the business as YACAC. <laughs> Most British and European airport chapels have some connection with YACAC. Um, now, of course, there had been military chaplaincy connected with airfields, but according to the YACAC <laughs> website, the first known civil aviation airport chapel is said to have opened in 1951 at Boston's Logan, in Logan International Airport, although others soon followed. Father Xavier de Moose of Brussels thought it would be a good idea to get airport chaplains together, and in 1967, 10 priests met in Brussels and the International Association of Civil Aviation <laughs> Chaplains was formed. Now you can see here that the International Association of Civil Aviation Chaplains describes itself as an ecumenical group of civil aviation chaplains whose work consists in the priestly, pastoral, and prophetic ministering to and with the people who work at and use airports stroke aviation. If we look at this, and uh, they say their purposes are to provide for and promote an essential fellowship under God for those engaged in ministry in the unique environment of civil aviation. Also, to develop our understanding of how aviation functions, how civil aviation functions, its effect upon people engaged in it and using it, and its influence in shaping our world. Now, what it pursues is a particular agenda, but that's perhaps only to be expected, given quite literally its founding fathers. I just want to show you very briefly a listing of YACAC members. Now, I know you can't read all of this, but I would just draw your attention to the proportion of YACAC members in the United Kingdom, in the United States, and also notably Australia 
and Canada. So there's a very definite kind of uh, bias here. Now, let me start by looking at Heathrow Airport. Um, because it'd be very, very important to have airport chapter three leaflets. A lot of airports are really big on their airport leaflets. Now, everything to do with London Heathrow is on a large scale. Over 300 commercial companies are based there, and around 68,000 employees work there round the clock in roughly three shifts. In addition, there are several thousand pilots plus crew, on top of which over 64 million passengers a year come through Heathrow. As you would expect then, the chaplaincy operation is a big one, with the majority being from Christian denominations. Here you can see. The chaplains have to deal with both a large and varied community of workers, as well as great numbers of people leaving arriving or passing through. There were chaplains at Heathrow from 1946, but the oldest and most obvious airport chaplaincy building at Heathrow is the Chapel of St. George. Um, this was opened in 1968 and is literally underneath the control tower at Heathrow Airport. So it's actually on the land side, that is, it, you can go to it uh, whether or not you're flying. And so you actually have to go underground to get to it. The chapel came in response to, and this is the chapel, it's rather quite bizarre actually, underground space. The chapel came in response to airport staff and crew demand, and a Catholic aviation guild was formed specifically as a pressure group to get a chapel. It was built as an ecumenical chapel, remember this is 1968, it was built as an ecumenical chapel. Um, St. George's gives you an idea of its, its location, St. George being patron saint of England. But it was constructed with three altars, one Catholic, one Anglican, and one for the free churches. However, these days, all the chaplains use the one altar at the front of the chapel, which was originally the Anglican altar. As I've said, the chapel is landside, which means it can be visited not only by those flying out or returning, but also those seeing off or greeting people. Pilgrimage groups going to Rome or Jerusalem often assemble at the chapel at the start of their journey. However, the passengers and those associated with them are referred to by the chaplains as visitors. As a chaplain remarked, one of the hallmarks of airport chaplaincy is that you rarely see travelers a second time. The airport workers and air crew are the real core parish, and marriages, baptisms, and funerals are performed at St. George's Chapel for those connected with Heathrow. And there's even a little memorial garden at Heathrow, but I would stress that this is, this is nothing to do with, yeah, this is not to do with aviation accidents or anything. These tend to be, um, memorials of people who have worked at the airport or pilots have been associated with the, the, the airport for many years. The Catholic chaplain also commented that the services conducted there in St. George's are often very flexible. For example, he had recently done a memorial service with readings from the Sikh scriptures because the space is seen by workers in the airport as an airport context rather than a Christian context. In terms of decoration though, perhaps with typically English understatement, the only overt reference to its airport context is the rather discreet air <laughs> <laughs> airline motif on the altar cloth. Oh, I'm so sorry, I've got it upside down. There we go. That's how it looks. How it looks. Pardon me. That's better. However, I should just mention that very much in keeping with UK's changing cultural landscape, since 1998, across the courtyard from St. George's, there's also been a multi-faith space, a prayer room, deliberately kept free of any decoration other than a map of the world and a multi-faith calendar, and an arrow indicating the direction of Mecca. Meanwhile, landside at Terminal 3, there is a multi-faith prayer area, 
And after years of negotiation, there is now airside in Terminal 3, a multi-faith prayer room, similarly decorated. And these negotiations were protracted for two reasons. Firstly, as Terminal 3 houses most of the airlines with Islamic connections, there was some resistance to the airside prayer room being multi-faith as opposed to an Islamic prayer area. And secondly, as the airside premises are in a retail area, everything on the airside is in a retail area, the commercial rental value of that small room, which is only about 20 foot square, is around £90,000 a year. And I, on a quick calculation, that's over $157,000 a year. So that was one reason why it took a bit of getting that space on the air side. So that's very briefly the story of Heathrow and some idea of how it is. But let me move on to Glasgow Airport. Glasgow Airport in the west of Scotland, my most frequent destination. Challenging the idea of the airport as a non-place, I'd always felt that Glasgow Airport was trying to present something self-consciously Scottish and Glaswegian. The Lightwood furniture has an unmistakable air of Charles Rennie Mackintosh, the artist, architect and designer whose public and domestic buildings and interiors were so much of Glasgow's artistic identity at the start of the 20th century. There is a fairly plain but stylish table. It's referred to as a table rather than an altar. And this always just has a vase of flowers on it. And there's also, as you see, a lectern to the side. Celtic decorative motifs and Celtic prayers are frequently employed on the photocopied chapel prayers which change each week and which visitors are encouraged to take away. The focal point of the chapel is the stained glass window. in which are embedded symbols depicting Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, and Judaism. And there's a brass plate embedded in the floor which indicates the direction of Mecca for Muslim prayer. The chapel is landside, and the official description on the airport website states, the non-denominational airport chapel on the second floor provides a quiet, restful place for passengers of all denominations. The chapel is open continuously for the benefit of all, I love this phrase, of all who wish to exercise the disciplines of a religion or who would wish merely to enjoy the peaceful atmosphere. <laughs> now that notion of the airport chapel as a space both for doing religion as well as simply providing a quiet place is a recurring theme in airport chapels. And if you think about it, of course reflects very traditional usage of churches. At Glasgow Airport, there had been talk of an airport chapel from the 1960s onwards, again with the impetus coming from air crew, engineers, and management. The, chapel at, the chaplain at that time, Peter Houston, admits that he was very iffy about the idea. Very much in the ethos of industrial chaplaincy, his view is where you are and the person you're talking to, that's your chapel. And that's a frequently stated sentiment among the chaplains who feel that most of their work takes place outside the chapel. Nevertheless, though, in the late 1980s, two offices, two former offices, were designated as chapel space, and an architect, Bill Shanks, was commissioned by the airport authority, and the airport's own squad of builders constructed it in three months. Houston claims that what finally got it built were three things. One, the personal wishes of the then manager, who was a Roman Catholic. Two, the desire of the airport authority to have a people focus in the airport. And three, the opportunity to upstage Edinburgh, <laughs> who still don't have one. Bill Shanks was very keen on the curved motif and the curved ceiling to create a sense of space. The bands of paintwork across the ceiling represent, he said, a nomad's tent, making the point that in one sense this is, this is a mobile church and this is a place for people on the move. The window features the sun and blues for the sky. The curves represent vapor trails and the blues give way to the greens and browns of the earth. Shanks also sold, told Peter Houston that 
The big yellow ball in the middle is anybody's god that wants one. <laughs> Shanks, it turns out, was a graduate of Glasgow School of Art, the institution attended by Charles Rennie Mackintosh and later housed in a building by him. And the chapel was built at a time when there was a great re revival of interest in Mackintosh. So, so that was absolutely right. That connection that I thought had to be true was there. Peter Houston wanted seasonal flowers only. He hates lilies. He wanted seasonal flowers only as a reminder of the changing of the seasons and of eternity, he says. And Houston's amb ambivalence towards the chapel vanished with the finished article. Its main usefulness for him being when dealing with distressed or bereaved people, having somewhere nice and appropriate to leave them in silence, and as he said, leave them in silence and give him some thinking time as to how best to handle that situation. So in Glasgow, we've got a self-consciously locally and nationally rooted interfaith chapel drawing on traditional Christian design, the stained glass window as a focal point, and making references to its situation in the airport. From 2003, the chapel, as it had been known, became signposted as the prayer room uh, so that other communities would feel more comfortable with that. And now from this year, there's also a prayer area here side. <clears throat> so I think even within Britain, that, that provides um, a, a fairly interesting contrast. But let me move now to mainland Europe and to Amsterdam, the airport at Amsterdam. Um, I'm not even going to try and pronounce Schiphol because I'll get it wrong. Yes. <laughs> According to the current chaplain, Howie Aden, chaplaincy at Schiphol was first suggested in 1931 by a customs and excise officer who was concerned by the fact that travellers departing on a Sunday had no opportunity to participate in mass before departure. But that suggestion was never followed up and the chaplaincy as such was the initiative not of the airport authority but rather of the Roman Catholic Bishop of Harlem. His church duties required regular travel, and he was deeply impressed with the con concept of airport chaplaincies that he had found in other parts of the world, particularly in the US and the UK. At his request, Amsterdam made a space available, and the first um, RC appointment was in 1975, followed by the first Protestant appointee um, in 1978. Now, the slogan of the Amsterdam chaplaincy is care at the crossroads, again, very much suggesting that idea of it being a place in space. And as the airport chaplaincy leaflet demonstrates, the condition and needs of air travelers are taken very seriously. I'm quoting, people who travel will often experience a range of emotions during their trip. The airport authority recognizes this and considers the emotional well-being of people at Schiphol to be a matter of important. importance. Sorry. It seeks to provide the means by which everyone is as comfortable as possible, regardless of their mood. The airport chaplaincy helps people to feel at home, providing a listening ear and comfort when needed. There are two chaplains and 25 voluntary co-workers active in chaplaincy work. Together, they provide for a place of rest where people of all nationalities and identities are welcome. Now, on occasion, Amsterdam, again, caters specifically for religious travel. For example, one volunteer mentioned an occasion a couple of years ago when a South American saint was being canonized and lots of people heading for Rome were transiting through Amsterdam. So either they booked in to have the Roman Catholic chaplain perform a mass for them, or if there were parish groups, their own priest could arrange in advance to borrow vestments and other communion requisites. This is a, a service that Amsterdam offers. But Amsterdam very much epitomizes the one space fits all ethos. <clears throat> and the assumption is that it should be possible for sacred space to be sacred to all and shared by all. As the leaflet states, all are welcome, regardless of their religious or non-religious background. At Amsterdam Airport, as befits its status as a major hub airport, chaplaincy is concentrated airside, and immediately becomes obvious that there's a bit of an issue as to how to refer to it. On the concourse, there are signs directing people to the meditation center. 
At the place itself, the sign declares it a place of worship lounge. On the airport website, it's described as silent centre or place of worship, while on the leaflet, it is described as airport chaplaincy. Being originally a church initiative, the term chapel was used originally, but the two chaplains decided to change the name to place of worship. By 1998, though, they felt this might be too limiting a term, so an ad hoc committee was formed in conjunction with the airport, involving also, though, the chaplains and a marketing company, which determined the currently favoured terms quiet room and meditation centre. Now, the architect of, the quiet, of this quiet centre, quiet room, is actually still to centrum, which I think gives a nicer impression somehow than just quiet room. Anyway, the architect, uh, Jan Benthern, was commissioned to, to do the space. It's his only work in the religious sphere, and he playfully calls it his cathedral. The space is divided into three areas. The quiet room, as the chaplaincy leaflet puts it, for individual prayer, meditation, reflection, or simply to find some peace and quiet. Then there's the reading room with books, magazines, and other material covering a range of issues and questions of personal spirituality. And a meeting room where the volunteers sit and you can have a cup of tea with them and people can drop in for a talk as they, as they feel fit. Now, I'm quoting the chaplain here. The location was chosen because the flood of natural light from above, because of the flood of the natural light from above, without the distraction of windows looking out on yet another set of airplanes. The artist of the panels is Jan Murk de Vries, and part of his remit was to design something which would not exclude any religion because of subject matter, and in fact would find a way to include all who entered there. The panels are abstracts of the elements and represent earth, fire, water, and space. These elemental things bind people together as people, regardless of religion or ethnicity. The inclusion of space represents the unity of which we are all a part. Uh, from, now this is it, sort of empty, but set up for a church service. There's a Catholic service in progress. But it's set up uh, also with washing facilities nearby so that it uh, can be used appropriately by Muslims. And they, I'm so impressed by the range. You know, there are prayer mats, there are little meditation stools, there are all sorts of things, whatever you might need there. <clears throat> One volunteer I spoke to said of the quiet room, it looks good and works good. And there's certainly lots of positive comment in the visitor's book. And it's interesting how often surprise and pleasure are expressed in the visitor's books in airport chapels at just finding such a place. So at Amsterdam, for example, we find, thank you for providing a serene place for prayer. And thanks be to God and the organizers for this room. Or there is no God but Allah. This prayer room was an extraordinary idea. Whoever thought of it, be blessed by Allah. And clearly the multi-faith ethos is appreciated by some visitors. One person wrote, if we can pray together and next to each other, give respect to each other in this small room, then why is it so hard to respect each other and pray next to each other in our much bigger world? Love and peace to all mankind. However, not everyone will play by those rules. The volunteer I spoke to described with considerable passion how upset he had been when a Jewish man had refused to go into the quiet room because a Muslim was praying there. Nevertheless, the chaplain states, we do not feel our Christian identity is in any way compromised or conflicted by acting as hosts to people of other faiths. And they attempt to serve and satisfy a huge range of needs by providing an all-inclusive space, a neutral space that nevertheless also has to be meaningful and appropriate to its varied users. Now, in very stark contrast to Amsterdam is Brussels Airport, which I think does have a completely unique chaplaincy setup. Instead of the multi-faith approach to religious uh, chaplaincy provision, epitomizes, Brussels epitomizes strong, and I mean strong, boundary maintenance. In the original airport at Brussels, I'll just put this off for a second, in the original airport at Brussels, 
The first request for chaplaincy came in the 1960s from the Catholics, not surprising when you recall that Father Xavier de Moose of Brussels was one of the founders of Yakak. And indeed, he served as the airport chapel for 25 years until 1988, when he was succeeded by Father Herman Boone. A Catholic chapel was established in 1962, and Father de Moose also suggested that there should be a Protestant presence, which there was from 1969. Somewhat ironically, as there'd never been any provision for chaplaincy in the original plan for the airport, the, the chapels ended up in the space originally designated for the casino. <laughs> Next came the mosque in 1987, a project of the Embassy of Senegal, and then the synagogue. <clears throat> and a Jewish chaplaincy was established in 1993. However, it's the contemporary situation which is really so striking. Brussels Airport was modernized and expanded in two phases. Terminal B opened in 1995 and Terminal A opened in 2002. So now, both land side in Terminal B and air side in Terminal A, so everything is duplicated. At Brussels Airport, there are, in miniature, Two Catholic chapels. This is the older of the Catholic chapels. This is the, the newer Catholic chapel. There are two Protestant chapels. This is the older Protestant chapel. This is the newer Protestant chapel. Two Orthodox chapels. Two mosques, two synagogues, and in addition, there is also the humanist chaplaincy. In terminal B, referred to as the moral consultant, I love that, the humanist <laughs> counsellor, <laughs> and in terminal A, simply referred to as the moral counsellor. <laughs> the Protestant chaplain, P Patricia Forceville, who's been involved there for 23 years, explained there are political reasons for the Brussels setup. The constitution means that religious believers have rights, so that what is extended to one religious group must be extended to others. And non-believers must have the same rights as religious believers. So if there is religious chaplaincy, there has to be humanist representation, which there has been since 1980. So rather unusually, whereas in most airports you wouldn't find this, in Brussels you find this, the Yakak symbol and the humanist symbol. When Terminal B, this is the, the 1990s one, was proposed, there were no plans originally for chaplaincy. Then the director of the airport suggested they could rent space, but of course that would have cost a fortune. So they started a media campaign to get chaplaincy in the new terminal. And eventually they were offered 200 square meters for a common space for prayer, silence and reflections that all the denominations and religions and the humanists could share. As Father Boone, the Catholic chaplain, told me, my Protestant colleague was ready to accept this proposal. I did refuse. I voted for respect and recognition of the proper identity of every denomination and religion for their theology, traditions, and religious artistic expression. With prayers for Christ's desire for unity and our efforts to break through this hard core for unity, we still sometimes have to protest against a cheap, false ecumenism and a certain tolerance which is dishonest and pluralistic. I have visited many of such interfaith chapels from Atlanta to Geneva and Johannesburg and almost always Catholic Christians are the losers. They have to compromise and surrender. The altar, the tabernacle with the presence of the Eucharist, they are a nuisance and a hindrance to others. Christ crucified on the cross, a statue of Our Lady, features with which Catholics are very familiar, are for others a stumbling block. 
Having accepted that there would be separate chaplaincies, the plan was to have the Catholic and Protestant chapels separated by the synagogue and the mosque. But Father Boone protested, contacted the Orthodox, and brought them in to create a Christian block. So now the three Christian chapels are entered through a common doorway forming this Christian area with the humanist councillor, the synagogue and the mosque outside that Christian block. In the newest building, Terminal A, opened in 2002, all groups have exactly the same space in rooms off of a common corridor. I think the airport authorities were probably feeling a bit desperate by this time. So they said that uh, there would be this one corridor and everyone could have exactly the same size space off of it but each group was responsible for doing with it what they would. Nevertheless, Patricia feels the fact that all the chaplaincies were planned and included from the start is a sort of recognition of their presence and significance. Now, as you've seen, the Orthodox chapels, the mosques and the synagogues don't really seem place specific. Apart from their miniature size, they give no clue that they're in an airport. The humanist spaces are notable for their presence rather than their decoration, I think it's fair to say. <laughs> However, I would like to look more closely at the Protestant and the Catholic chapels. So this again is the <coughs> Protestant chapel in the older building. Now, as Protestant chapels, you wouldn't expect them to be highly decorative. And as Abdul, the Muslim chaplain, commented, the Protestant chapels are closest to the mosque, very plain. Patricia feels that the Protestant chapel is used by a variety of people, many just wanting moments of quietness. She used to have music on in the background, but stopped that in response to comments in the visitors' books. The Terminal B Protestant chapel has a seating area directed towards a simple, elegant marble table, and to one side, the specifically commissioned painting, Home, a Cross, a Wing, and a Prayer. <clears throat> now, in however minimalist a way, that artwork does reflect both Christian affiliation and some reference to travel. However, if we look at the newer Protestant chapel, at first glance, it seems even less specifically Christian, indeed religious, with a totally abstract work of art that she calls imagination made by um, uh, Catherine Ori Meuter, um, actually one of Patricia's um, uh, parishioners, and she said it was simply there to give the chapel more color. However, correspondence with Willie de Prins, the architect of the Terminal A Chapel, revealed some interesting insights into its construction, and he actually sent me his uh, drawing plans of he said, we had some discussion before starting the project. After that, I was given a free hand in the design. To start with, there was only this rectangular prison-like room. We simply changed the form into an oval shape. This ellipse gives the chapel an aspect of infinity, no corners. The table is put in the two focus points and has again this smooth form. The pedestal in glass makes it float in space. The cross in the front part of the table has a cross of Celtic design. In fact, let's show it's a plexiglass stand and there's a Celtic cross here. The lighting, several small lamps spread over four cables and going through the oval centers can be dipped and these refer to a starry night. This I find fascinating. We didn't want to remind the visitor of such things as planes and airports because very often it's one of the reasons for coming to the chapel. The lower wall as you enter the chapel invites you to go around and sit as if you were in a safe zone. The back of this wall has Bibles in several languages placed in two curves to symbolize north and south. In other words, we wanted to create a peaceful and simple space, not overloaded, but direct in its function. Also, compared to the other chapels, a very low budget realization. Now again, you see that business of deliberately not reminding people that they're in an airport, but also a real effort to create something spatially meaningful and to deal with some of the anxieties and stresses facing travelers. 
But the striking thing about the Brussels Roman Catholic chapels is that they are absolutely the opposite. They alone really accentuate and celebrate their location both in Brussels and more specifically and strikingly in an airport. In the Terminal B Chapel, well, this is dedicated to Our Lady of Europe. And reflecting Brussels' position at the heart of Europe, the original European flag of 12 stars on a blue background has been framed in the windlip here, framed in the windlip of a Boeing engine, and it's placed behind the statue. I am learning ever such a lot about bits of airplanes during this, I have to say. Also, altar. The altar is actually part of a wing from a Boeing aircraft elevated on a plexiglass table. Which I just find fascinating. Although, do you know, I'm not sure how comforting I find bits of airplane. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's maybe a personal thing. In the newer building, and I think this is also quite interesting, in the newer building, the Catholic chapel is dedicated to the Archangel Raphael, the protector of people on the move. And I think it's quite interesting that uh, you have a, um, an orthodox icon in this, in this chapel, which is otherwise pretty, pretty hot on boundary maintenance. Um, for this chapel, artist Paul de Bont used strator and rotor parts of an Airbus engine for the altar, the crucifix, and the lectern. He also created this most striking statue of Our Lady of Aviation. Again, from, as it were, bits of melted down airplane. <laughs> the leaflets of this statue, available in the chapel, includes the quotation, sorry, includes quotations from the Magnificat and Psalm 91, verse 4. God covers you with his feathers, and you find shelter underneath his wings. And on the back we read, From iron and fire, Paul de Bont forged this statue. Strongly straight, Mary arising in God's spirit, caring for her child Jesus on her soft arm. Christian belief makes one free and happy. Human beings grow wings, people and aircraft. Technical inventiveness, imitating birds, carried by winds. People care for people across the skies towards other people with love and peace reaching for God's light. And I think this very striking image and the message seems to epitomize the Catholic approach in Brussels airport. It makes strong faith claims and it celebrates aviation. We might argue that this is unsurprising given the Catholic tradition of adapting to and incorporating its surroundings. And in some ways, the, the altar with the air, aircraft wing uh, sort of reminded me of a native Canadian church I visited in Quebec, where the altar was constructed out of snowshoes. Nevertheless, the adoption of an airplane wing in the altar of one chapel and the physical incorporation of aircraft engine material in the decorative items in the other chapel shows a rootedness in and engagement with context which is somehow both bold and subtle. Comparing Amsterdam and Brussels, I commented that perhaps one positive aspect of the Brussels setup might be that each group could use space in its own way without compromising or negotiating. However, the Protestant chaplain said she would have favored an ecumenical center for Christians, but this wasn't possible as the Catholics wanted their own space. Furthermore, Patricia said there was much to be said for an interfaith space because it would give greater credibility. Her concern is that, and I'm quoting, Brussels gives the wrong message. She said, religion here appears fragmented, separate, when we should be promoting a message of peace, love, and care for each other. Okay, let me move briefly on to some of the issues and changes in the cultural landscape relating to the chapels. So just as we see in airports miniature versions of religious buildings, it could be argued that we see in airport chaplaincy a microcosm of various issues that are being played out in society and the changing cultural and religious landscape. Heathrow Airport chaplaincy 
could be characterized as the Christianity and other religions approach, which has developed naturally as Heathrow has continually expanded, simply reflecting the increasing religious and cultural diversity of both staff and passengers. Nevertheless, there are potential tensions between strong truth claims or evangelism and the inclusivity imposed on Christian chaplains in this context, and indeed Christian users of multi-faith premises. <coughs> Excuse me. This message from the current president of YACAC, Michael Bincer, reflects the positive view. The availability of chapels or prayer rooms for people of all faiths is a valued facility that our airports provide, and they are appreciated as places of tranquility by all who use them. If there's one thing I've learned as we share our pilgrimage of life with those of other faiths, it is that in showing hospitality to others and engaging in dialogue with them, we need not feel we are diminishing our own faith and trust in God. However, this might be contrasted with the less than happy experience of the Catholic editor of Christian Order when he was killing time at London's Terminal 3. I'm quoting. Curiosity lured me to the multi-faith prayer room in the Terminal 3 Departures Lounge. To enter this bare concrete box, hardly 20 foot square and without a single identifying religious symbol, apart from a few scattered prayer rugs, was to peer into the ecumenical abyss. Way out beyond the furthest horizons of minimalism, it looked like a hoax. I even checked that I had the right place, but it was no joke and no mistake. The Heathrow Airport Chaplaincy Team works as a partnership, the glossy brochure proudly proclaimed, listing the Anglican, Catholic, Buddhist, Hindu, Muslim, Jewish and Sikh chaplains. The prayer room, it explained, is open all day for private prayer. Inside, the space is kept plain in order to respect individual beliefs. The pain and humiliation was acute. The one true faith brought forth at such unspeakable cost by our Lord Jesus Christ publicly associated with this monument to nihilism. So there are different takes on it, <laughs> to cut a long story short. <laughs> Meanwhile, though Glasgow Airport has been multi-faith from the start, it has been multi-faith in a very Christian way, as we saw from the physical setup of it. The completely multi-faith approach of Amsterdam Airport reflects its age, late 1990s, and contemporary assumptions and expectations about religion, including the great confusion as to how to refer to it. In Amsterdam, the emphasis is on accentuating commonality, promoting and presuming mutual respect and understanding, fostering meaningful and insightful neutrality. And in Brussels, by contrast, we see strong boundary maintenance, highly differentiated spaces, aversion to compromise, apart perhaps from the Protestants, and an insistence on people having the right to do their own thing in their own space, in their own way. Airport chaplaincy also hints at some of the tension between religion and the secular. This is most marked in Brussels in the positively anti-religious humanist rhetoric that you find there and more subtly in the negotiation between religion and commercial interests at Heathrow, because of course they're now negotiating to get space airside at Terminal 4. It's also worth noting the extent to which we can see in issues surrounding airport chaplaincy, similar ones to those involved in studying and teaching about religion. There is the choice between accentuating similarity or stressing separate identities going for insightful neutrality or privileging believers' perceptions. There are also gender issues relating to the presentation of religion. For example, there are these gender, in, sorry, gender <coughs> issues relating to the presentation of religion. For example, some women's needs are not really considered in the design of prayer areas, and that's a realization that only came to me when I worked out what was different about the prayer facilities at Singapore Airport, namely that there was a curtained off space for the women. Now the stories of the different airports are in many ways related to relationships. Relationships between travelers and airports. 
relationships between chaplains and their parish of airport workers and <coughs> their visitors. The relationships between airport chapels and their situation nationally and locally and the fact that they are in airports. Relationships between Christian denominations and between religions and between the sacred and the secular. The stories of the different airports also involve something very familiar to scholars of religious folk life, namely the expression of religious ideas and denominational theologies through material culture. And I think the real challenge for a multicultural, religiously plural and changing cultural landscape is how to create sacred spaces that are meaningful without being simply bare and unlovely. But I must conclude. I hope I've demonstrated here that there's much of interest to the scholar of religious folk life in the study of airport chapels. And of course, I've merely scratched the surface of what could be said and done in relation to them. There is continuity in the extent to which religion and travel are connected and the religious resources drawn upon in transit, even if there have been considerable technological changes in how we travel and what our expectations of religion might be. <coughs> However, there is also currently a huge irony surrounding air travel. Following the events of September 11, 2001, the chaplaincy centre visitors books at Amsterdam airport were taken away by security so that messages in Arabic could be translated. Since September 11, Sabina, Belgium's national carrier, has gone into liquidation and the airport throughput has reduced by about 50%. So the airport's many, many chaplaincy facilities, like the airport itself, are emptier than ever before. Since September 11, hourly security checks are made and noted in the visitors' books in Glasgow Airport. Although the assumption has traditionally been that the anxiety caused by or surrounding air travel will compel people to turn to religion, these days, at least superficially, it is religion itself that is regarded as posing the greatest threat to air travellers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bowman. That was wonderful. Um, we have two distinguished respondents to this panel, and before I introduce them, I'd like to remind you all that the Section meeting for the Folk Belief and Religious Folk Life section is tomorrow at noon in this room. And hope you all will come. Um, um, our respondents are Dr. Kim Lau of the University of Utah, who's in Gender Studies and in the English Department here. Uh, her book is New Age Capitalism, and is about New Age spirituality and commodification. And she's just completed another book titled Body Language, a Discursive Ethnography, um, with Sisters in Shape. And our uh, second respondent is Dr. Terry Brewer, a senior lecturer in anthropology and cultural studies at the University of and Maggie for inviting me to respond, um, which was really quite a challenge because this paper was so thorough. Um, but as um, Marion said, there are so many fascinating issues at stake here, many of which she touched on. Um, and so I'm going to try to just make a, a couple of very quick comments um, that hopefully will inspire some more discussion as I, I'm sure that many of you have questions and so I want to leave a lot of time for a question and answer. Um, but as Marion was ending her paper talking about several different sorts of relationships that these airport chapels inspire, it made me think of the relationship between um, the private practice of religion and the public performance of religion and the relationship that exists between the two of those things. And I was struck in particular by the fact that I had never even heard of an airport, uh, airport chapel. I haven't traveled too extensively outside of the United States, but I had never even seen signage for such chapels in my travels in the United States. And it was somewhat of a relief to see that not many others of you had either because I thought maybe I'm just completely you know, oblivious to this as I'm running through the airport. Um, but I, I'm struck by that certain level of invisibility and what happens in these areas or these locations that are sort of 
put to the side or hidden from um, view. I think most of us know where the malls are, where the food court is, where the um, crown law or whatever the, you know, secret place that you only get to go to if you fly a million miles a year, whatever. We see all of those things regularly, but we don't see the chapel space. At the same time, um, I think we see many examples, public performances of religion or religious practice. The one that Marion cites is the um, example of the pilgrims changing into their Hajj clothes in the boarding area once past the um, the security gate. And just this morning, I was at the Salt Lake Airport picking up a friend, and as I was waiting for her, I witnessed a ritual that's very common in Salt Lake airports, and I know those of you around here probably know what I'm talking about, which is the welcome home um, celebration for return missionaries. And these are quite extensive, um, what I would say, religious performances. I would call them religious performances, although they're not actually performances of religion per se. Um, and the one that I witnessed today, um, there were probably about 12 little kids under the age of eight and their parents and spouses and then the next generation. So I, I believe two sets of grandparents. It was hard to tell exactly the arrangements, but there were at least 20 people there. And they all had signs that said, you know, welcome home, Uncle Kenny, or welcome home, Elder so-and-so. And they had balloons and things like this. And this, to me, is a really interesting phenomenon that I haven't really witnessed in very many other places. But there are also farewell um, sort of leaving ceremonies. And this religious performance literally sort of dominated the space at hand. And there were actually three of them ongoing at once because there were three return missionaries coming off one flight. So it was quite at the bottom of the escalator since you can no longer go to the gates. There was quite a collection of people. And so it makes me um, curious about the distinction or the difference between the public performance of some sort of religious association, at least, and the um, private practice that's sort of hidden away in these chapels. And I'm you know, just sort of curious what other people make of that or think of that. And um, let's see. And of course, pilgrims, like missionaries, link together for us symbolically tra the associations between travel and religion and um, ritual that Marianne talked about in her, in her paper. Um, so that, that was one thing that I'm hoping some of you might be interested in talking about. Um, secondly, I was really struck by the timeliness of Marianne's topic, and I would have thought that these chapels were new, maybe even since um, September 11th, 2001, because they seem so connected in my mind in that way, that fear and anxiety of flying, even though fear and anxiety of travel ex have existed for such a long time, I would have placed um, these chapels in a much more recent context. So I was really interested to see that in some cases people were talking about this as early as the 1930s, I believe. Um, and the liminal space that's created by travel in any case is exacerbated in the post 9-11 era by the very rituals that one now has to go through to get through an airport to actually get onto an airplane. And in some ways, um, these chapels seem a way, and I'm using the term chapel really loosely to, um, to refer to all sorts of meditative spaces, <laughs> apparently I don't know <laughs> the lingo either, um, to subvert the intense liminality and ritual of going through the airport, right? So that th there's increased frustration, I would say, at having to derobe in many ways and in many more ways than we used to have to in terms of taking off shoes, taking off coats, taking off all, all these elements and sort of stripping down um, in the sorts of anger that exists there, I think, um, or sort of anger and alarm the ways in which people are um, constantly sort of narrating weight, frustration, um, inconvenience, that these sort of things contribute to an environment of chaos that I think is, is above and beyond the general chaos of um, travel prior to this era. And so chapels in this context provide a way of, I want to say, almost subverting that liminality and, um, and inserting a particular type of 
everyday life, of home life and security that's marked in a different way than sort of the security or supposed security that we see symbolized by armed militia in, in a number of airports. And in this context, I, I think um, we see a, a really interesting cultural phenomenon accompanying this, which is the emergence of the airport as a site to be discussed in popular media. So we have, for instance, this new TV show with Blair Underwood and Heather Locklear called LAX, and it's actually about the supposed hidden city of LAX and all the crises that occur there and the ways in which they um, intervene in these crises and, and keep you all safe traveling through LAX. Um, but part of it, and I've never seen this except for in the you know, previews and advertisements. So I don't know if they acknowledge any kind of chapel. I'm guessing that they probably don't. But just the sort of fact that there's this mainstream attention to the airport indicates that this is a really timely topic and one that's really rich for further investigation. Um, and the idea that the chapel can somehow make concrete elements of home in this transitional liminal phase um, is supported by or makes me think of the recent Tom Hanks movie, which also I did not see, I'm claiming right now, and will never see, um, The Terminal, <laughs> in which this person who is the sort of ultimate liminal character because his home country has been taken away from him through revolution and war, and therefore is not, for some reason, not allowed to leave the airport and must live in the airport and he, you know, sleeps in the airport, he shaves in the airport, he falls in love in the airport, and the airport workers, you know, all help him court Catherine Zeta-Jones. Um, and so there we see like sort of a, you know, a Hollywood example of someone literally making airport home in a way that I think these chapels enable travelers to do on sort of a momentary um, small, small basis. Um, let's see. And, and the last thing that I was um, really intrigued by is the question of what would happen if we shifted our perspective and thought of airports not so much as liminal spaces, but spaces of beginnings and endings. And I think Marion is right on in talking about the liminality. Clearly, these are places that we move through and transition through. But if you sit in an airport waiting long enough for a flight, you also notice that these are places where people are, are leaving their starting points and their ending points, and they're simultaneously both in some ways, right, because the starting of a voyage is the ending of a particular moment in a relationship. So we see those two sides, and I'm just wondering, does that sort of conceptualization of the airport as starting ending point change or alter our understanding of how these chapels might potentially function for the person um, if they aren't so much the hub space, um, despite the, or in addition to being the hub space, if we consider them from that other angle. So just some questions um, and perspectives that I, you know, think touch up nicely with Marianne's talk, and, and hopefully that we'll have time to investigate in more detail. Thanks. to um, thank Leonard and Maggie for organizing this and for um, asking us to, to participate and, and keep the conversation going with Marion. Um, I've had the, the great pleasure of taking groups of students around Glastonbury with Marion a number of times, and I think now we'll have to extend this to some airport visits, <laughs> won't we? I think this is a really fascinating project, and it's one that Marion's obviously done a lot of work on to give uh, proper background context because the the groups and the overlap between the groups who are involved in the chapels, both those who are involved in the cultural politics of discussing the creation of the chapels, the chap sorry, the chap the chaplains themselves, whose relationship. I would imagine is probably quite interesting because unlike most other kinds of um, um, pastoral religious care, these chapels don't often involve regular services 
and may not, in fact, and I think this is a question that, that came up in my mind as you were talking, very often involve direct contact between the chaplains and the travelers. I, don't, I didn't get a feeling for that from what you've said so far. Um, it's also uh, fascinating that you have a couple of different discrete groups that may not overlap very much in their use of the chapels, which is to say um, the, the transient population going through the airport as travelers. And then Marion mentioned that, in fact, for some of these chapels, the most important um, congregation, if you can use the term, is actually that of the airport workers. And I wondered whether the, um, looking at the, at the motifs that had been incorporated into the design of, of um, decor in the chapels, whether there was any relationship between who the primary user group for that chapel was and the decor. So for example, if you have relatively more airplane parts, <laughs> is, it, is it possible that that's a marker of an airport chapel that was more clearly created with the airport workers in mind? Or what was the process of decision about the, the, the design motifs? How much of that was in what the architect had originally planned, and how much is that of that is, is things that people may have um, made or donated to the chapels in some cases. And when you're working with a, a sample right now of just a few airports, it, it's very suggestive, and it raises questions that you might ask later when you have more to have a look at. Um, so the consideration of cultural politics was fascinating, and that's going to provide, I think, a really rich context for further exploration of the actual use of the chapels by the travelers, by the staff, and the extent to which there is a developing and perhaps syncretic vernacular tradition amongst and between the airports, or in some cases, as, as you're saying, maybe about um, Glasgow as a, as a competition um, between airports. Um, I don't, I have, you know, questions that I want to throw out, and I think one of them is from the point of view of an airport chaplain, how much of this is about active intervention with travelers, for example, and how much of this is about being there as a presence, um, being a caretaker for a facility, uh, being available in emergencies, but not actually having much interaction. How does chaplaincy in the, um, in the airport relate to the pastoral duties of the people who act as chaplains, whatever faith it's from, within the larger faith community in the surrounding area? What are the differences from their point of view? And to what extent are people who act as airport chaplains um, following careers in airport chaplaincy? Um, I think from just from conversations we've had outside this room, it, it seems as though there's, there's some interesting um, patterns developing there and some chaplains who are very, very focused on the airport and find that to be really um, um, extraordinarily interesting place to work for all sorts of reasons. Not all of which may always have to do with the, <laughs> the clientele they serve. Um, might, might be out of enthusiasm for the airport itself. Um, I have a note here to myself that I can't, <laughs> I can't read my writing on. Um, when the primary clientele is airport workers, how much we, we know from looking at the, the life of congregations within um, parishes or faith communities outside of airports that very often the 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 congregation plays an important part in shaping the day-to-day -day practice of a place of worship, whether it's in the form of the service, contributions to the service, um, or whether it's in care for a facility or the creation of other kinds of activities that might take place. But that's, that's going to be an interesting area, particularly when you're, when you're looking at the sort of vernacularization um, aspect of this. Uh, with the with the um, sorry, my handwriting is too bad. I didn't wear my glasses when I was writing. 
um, and I and I, I would end by saying that I think that that the um, um, comments that um, Kim made about um, the reaction post 9/11, I am aware that there is this long tradition of airport chapels, and and I wouldn't have. I wouldn't necessarily have assumed that there were more of them or that they were used very differently um, post 9-11, but I wonder whether there's more to be looked at there and whether the, um, I mean, you've, you've outlined some of the ways in which um, chapels became become a site of surveillance by uh, officials because of an assumption that particularly in the case of Islamic use, they might, they, there might be a connection. But um, I, won I wonder in what ways the usage by visitors might be different and how much information chaplains really have on that um, when so many of these places are used for private prayer and reflection, which doesn't necessarily leave a trace that you can actually get a sense of the shape of as a, a field worker short of sitting in the back of airport chapels very quietly and inconspicuously and um, yeah and 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 watching as they're used through the day so um, a few questions and a few thoughts and I think there are probably a, n a number in the audience for discussion as well Yes, could you respond, Mary? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Would you like to respond here or there? Uh, I don't know. Uh, here. Oh, maybe. not really. Okay. Well, thank you both Kim and Terry for those comments, and uh, I, more, f still more food for thought. A um, couple of points. There's also on British TV been something called the airport, which is, is being filmed in Heathrow. And there is such excitement among the chaplains because in the next series of the airport, the chaplains will be featured. Um, one of the things that I spent a day shadowing uh, one of the Anglican chaplains at Heathrow a, a few weeks ago, and uh, one of the things that the, the chaplains are going on about is their constant attempt to get visibility. So they were very excited about the fact that in the in-house newspaper, they now have a chaplain's corner. So they've got a wee column uh, went, what, in this weekly paper for the airport community. And in addition to that, recently, in addition to the Chaplain's Corner, there had also been a separate article on uh, Pascal Ryan, who's the RC chaplain. And they see this uh, appearance in airport as, as being very exciting, again, about being visibility. So this idea about getting visibility is hugely important to the chaplains, and they're always trying to think of ways to do it. Um, you're right. I mean, again, I get back to Peter Houston's I, at Glasgow being iffy about the idea of, of a chapel because he didn't want to be pinned to it. And as I, as I think I mentioned, I would reinforce the chaplains don't necessarily see the chapel as being their main site of operations, although that's the most obvious thing for travelers is the space rather than the people. But having said that, for example, in Terminal 4 at Heathrow, where there isn't actually a prayer facility, you've just got the chaplains on shifts constantly just wandering around. So we've got um, uh, Murray, who's uh, a part-time Anglican uh, chaplain there, and he's, he's a former engineer. So he just loves talking to the techies. Oh, whereas there's a f one of the full-time, one of the two full-time Salvation Army chaplains, uh, Major Janet, she, she, does, she handles the retail side. She, she visits the people, not just the people on the concourse, but the people in the shops. Because she makes the point that in some of these airport shops, you know, the amazingly expensive pen shops, they may only get two customers during the day, so they get really lonely, and they like someone to call in on them. So there are those relationships being developed there. And of course, I had to say the, the Salvation Army chaplains are very funny because they, they figure they do better on visibility than the regular chaplains, although occasionally they're, they're mistaken either for pilots or security men. <laughs> um, I have to just say, I, as it happened, one of the in-flight movies on my way across was Terminal, so I've seen it. 
and I'm pleased to announce that there is a romance involved in it and uh, although you don't see the chapel you do see the yakak symbol and the implication is that the couple gets married in the airport chapel isn't that nice um and i think again kim is is uh, bringing up very much this issue which i think really does need exploring the the different usages between airside and landside chapels and that was why i was trying to stress which were airside and which were landside so glasgow airport chapel uh, peter was saying that realized after a while that some people just would come to the airport occasionally just for an outing you know to do the shopping to have a meal and maybe pop into the chapel the chaplains at uh, heathrow were saying that for some people because there are lots of buses go to heathrow for some people it's easier for them to get on a bus and come to heathrow and and, and go, go to a service there than it is to go to their local church so so they do have outsiders coming and using that and I think that different clientele that you're talking about, that's, that's right. I, I say I get back to the point that the chaplains see the airport workers as their parish. And actually the travelers, the high profile ones, if you like, the travelers as the visitors, with no expectation of being able to develop a relationship with the travelers, nor even in fact being in personal contact with them. And I think that different usage is also reflected in Heathrow Airport, the uh, St. George's Chapel, there are two Lockerbie memorials. You remember the, the Lockerbie disaster. There is one um, very small, actually, little freestanding memorial, which is simply a list of all the people who died in that disaster. And it's just off to one side. And I, I, I'm not really sure what usage that gets. It seemed to me it was very tucked away and there was nothing going on around it. However, what there is, perhaps not surprisingly, is a large marble embedded into the wall of chapel memorial to the pilots and air crew. And that has flowers, it has cards, and the chaplains were saying there, that is never bare. There is always something there. And I, again, I think that reflects the two, the two clientele, if you like. Um, the decor business is interesting. I think um, the Brussels ones in fact, all of them really are geared, you know, the Brussels ones are geared to the travelers um, as well as the, the airport workers. What is clearly a huge deal at Brussels is that uh, every Christmas in one of the hangars at Brussels, they have a midnight mass. Again, this is one of Father Boone's uh, initiatives. They have midnight mass to which are invited all of the airport workers and they actually put notices up for it in all of the the airport hotels in the area so that if you're stuck in an airport hotel on christmas eve for whatever reason you're invited along to that and i've seen pictures of this and it is absolutely packed airport hangar with not surprisingly air aircraft in the background and again paul de bont and this gets onto this relationship with with the artist herman boone has commissioned paul de bont to do a number of chapels in and around the Brussels area. So they have a relationship. And Paul has, again, made in that airlip, that casing for a Boeing engine, um, a, a nativity scene set in that. And that's what's brought out uh, for these Christmas Eve services. And I, thinking about it, having seen our fabulous retablo maker, it, that idea of putting the nativity scene in the, in the bit of engine strikes me very much like, the, like that sort of art. So that's going on. The other thing is, another aspect of Brussels, the unseen aspect, if you like, of chaplaincy is in the cargo area, there's a chapel on the ground floor of the cargo area. And the cargo area itself has 4,000 people working there. So there's a separate religious facility for the cargo area and, and I thought this was fascinating, each year, the cargo handlers have to deal with around 1,200 coffins coming in and out. And again, part of that chapel facility there is very much about being able to either send off or greet appropriately the return of um, deceased relatives uh, who, as it ha who have to come through cargo, but this is alleviated by being able to take people out to to that chapel and so that's a whole other aspect that I, you know a, a completely hidden aspect but that's that's going on as well so that's very much about you know a very specific aspect of, of the, the, the airline business so thank you very much for, for all your comments and there's, there's lots to think about so thank you
Would anyone like to ask a question? Oh, look. <laughs> Let's start there. And could you please tell us uh, your name and where you're from? Hi, Michael. someone is praying, that is an expression of dogma and faith in that sense. In the first case, it's more, it's almost an ethnic identity. And in a situation such as Salt Lake City, where the Mormon church is a dominant church, there's a kind of, I would guess, a lack of self-consciousness about those kinds of expressions anyway. But to pray is a very different, it seems to me, situation than a welcoming back, even though that's deeply rooted, I mean, with the, with, you know, in that tradition. Um, the other point I just wanted to make, Marion, was for what it's worth. Uh, you referred at one point to the ethos of the airports su as suggesting themselves as non-places. Now, to some extent, but as you said at the, uh, to the end of there, uh, with the development of airports as malls, they're kind of changing a little bit. But, but it strikes me that the, and by the way, I have been to a few different uh, rooms. And they haven't been particularly, they haven't been specifically denominational in any way. And I was struck by that idea that they're kind of empty of symbolism and of uh, sort of affective quality. Um, and it struck me that the chapels, what you're describing, it seems to me, is situations in which those kinds of spaces are negotiating. They themselves could be described as non spaces too, as non, you know, because. You know, and, and so you get the Catholic priests saying, we're not going to accept this. We want the Blessed Virgin Mary in there. And you get a kind of, what you seem to be showing is a variety of ways of dealing with the problem of trying to create some kind of meaningful space in a, non, in a larger non-space. Um, and in some cases, the idea is be bare and let everybody fill it in. Uh, and that could be argued to be acceptable to everybody, but at the same time it might be acceptable to nobody, you know, because it's too empty. And with everything you show, it just seems to me a range along a continuum of either vernacularizing or personalizing or not those kinds of spaces. Are we going to make this quality space that's in a larger, uh, you know, one airport could be anywhere in the world kind of thing? And it just strikes me that that's, that there is part of the uh, process that you're showing us. I don't know how that strikes you, but it seems to me there's an interesting dynamic going on there. I think that's right, and I think there is this issue of whether it gets back to how rooted uh, the chapel, the spaces are, either in terms of being in an airport, and it's, that's why I find the ones that are deliberately setting out to help you pretend that you're not in an airport are very interesting compared to the ones that are actually constantly reinforcing that with the motifs. And again, yes, this, this idea of whether you're actually 
whether you're actually saying, okay, this is in the airport, but it's damn well in Glasgow. Or it's, you do see what I mean? You're, whether you're making a point about it, where it is rooted and relating it to where it is. But there's also a sense of it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's not just a humanist space, it's a Catholic space, or it's a, you know, and there's a lot of that to some extent. How, how much are we going to market? I don't know if you said this in the very beginning of your presentation because I missed it, but there are uh, chapels in train stations as well. I'd love to say that. Did you say that? I didn't say that, I but I mean, this is this is very much just sort of, if you like, one aspect of industrial chaplains. Yeah, I was when I was an altar boy as a child, I served, but it was a specifically Catholic uh, chapel in South Station in Boston. You were mentioning Logan Airport as one of the early things. So that's another story. I, mean, I think I think the idea of industrial chaplaincy is, is that's the background, it seems to me, that a lot of people have come out of in airport chaplaincy. Um, I mean, at Bristol Airport, which is my local airport, there is there is a chaplain, but she's only available between 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock on a Tuesday. <laughs> so, which I'm just <laughs> 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 the, the other thing, actually, sorry, picking up something that Terry had said, this idea of the airports as a community, that is quite a, people who work in airports see themselves as quite a special community. And what I find fascinating is that, um, I've already mentioned that one of the chaplains is an engineer, so loves the techie side of it. But uh, the Roman Catholic chaplain at Eastwell, I think fascinatingly, before he became a Roman Catholic priest, was an immigration officer at Eastwell. Oh. One of the other Anglican volunteers worked for Iran Air. She was both working in the L London Central Office and also coming out to check the baggage in because she had the language. And she, having retired from that, is now working. So there is this pool of, of something you know, special about civil aviation. Sorry, you've got to back there. I, I just have to say, I'm, I'm always, of course, is, is this has made me uh, think about the presence of chapels and hospitals, mm -hmm. which is another fascinating place. And also something that, uh, how religion has changed in American airports. If you recall the great uh, problems that people had with encountering Hare Krishna and members of the Unification Church 10, 15 years ago in American yes. airports, and they sort of have disappeared um, within the context of, uh, you know, bumping into American security groups in airports. Yes, in the, all the way in the back. Oh, is that, oh yeah. <laughs> Very, I, I may have missed in the beginning two questions. One is, um, are there uh, offering boxes at, in any of these? Or, has, has that ever been an emphasis? And second is, is, especially with the Roman Catholic, any mention of votive candles? I mean, I know the fire hazard, all that, but was there, even in the planning process, talking with architects, engineers, was there the request for or, or the pressure uh, to, to include votive candles? Yeah. Uh, fair on donation, no. I, in my work so far, I've never encountered that. And that is partly because, uh, certainly, the, the ethos is very much that the chaplains have to be supported by their denomination or religious groups. The second thing on candles is the only place I've seen candles is in the bizarre St. George Chapel at Heathrow. And I think that is largely because it is this kind of vast underground space away from the terminal. And also there are people there constantly. Most of the chapels, of course, uh, are, are not staffed as it were, but as it happens at St George's there is the chaplain office beside it so you know, there's always someone around so there is always a measure of people being there. So St George's is the, the only place I've seen that and, and uh, there are the little racks of, of candles but I haven't seen that anywhere actually in the terminal building as I can put it that way. I wish there could be a professor from Brigham Young University here to ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> well I've just got to say I've just been thoroughly and Engaged by this because I'm going to take a wild stab that I'm probably the only person here who's both been a chaplain to people in in the, who are air travelers and also a, a folklorist. So those were two things that I used to try to keep separate, and I feel like <laughs> now I can't really do that anymore. But I just want to say you you really captured the, the the spirit of the thing very well, and this this tension between the model that the Brussels airport has adopted versus some of the airports is a very real thing that. that chaplaincies everywhere struggle with the, how, how, how to deal with this because our preferences here might be towards the more one chapel more ecumenical but that in and of itself is is off-putting to a lot of the people who are familiar with a particular tradition a particular uh, particular way of doing things I thought you handled that uh, very well uh, some of my questions have been answered but I wondered 
in the United States, we kind of have the perception of, of Europe and England in particular as being very irreligious. What would you say your research has to tell up, re-educate us Americans, perhaps about this misperception? And the other, the other question I had was, uh, do airport chaplains find that the this is people take the opportunity of travel and anonymity and the chance the chance that we're probably never going to see this guy again as an opportune time for confessional and, and things like that. So, I think um, to take the first question, that that's quite a tricky one, but I, I do think that uh, I do think there may be some misconceptions about the level of religiosity, whether individually or in organised religion. Um, and as I say, that, that the very fact that there is perceived to be the need for and official support for and indeed funding, because again at Heathrow, although the chaplains have to be supported by their individual denominations or religious groups, nevertheless it is the airport who is you know, underwriting the fact that they're in there, they're paying their bills, they're providing the photocopying and office facilities and so on. And as I say, one of the arguments for getting the chapel at at Glasgow was that it was seen as a people focus. So there is this view that people need it, people want it, and that, that people use it. Um, sorry, your second point. Well, my second question was: Do is this a, do the chaplains see this as have they experience that this is an opportune time to have the kind of pastoral contact in mm -hmm. terms of confession okay. yeah. that yeah. might not be that other people might not take advantage of? Yes, I think there is an extent to which. I suspect, especially with the roving chaplains, if I can put it that way, because they are actually, I would say that the chaplains are quite often quite proactive. I mean, that's what one of them said to me, that we, we, you know, you're not in this business long before you learn to read body language. And so they will be approached sometimes, but they will also quite often approach others that they feel look distressed or look anxious. And so, the, so they are quite proactive in that. And yes, I mean, um, Pascal was saying, yes, of course, people sometimes, be because of that, that, that comment about people being away from their roots and so on, that, that people will, if they're feeling stressed or they're just feeling kind of out of their normal situation, quite often will seek to, to tell the chaplains things that they perhaps wouldn't have told their own um, professional religious person at home. And I think there is partly that safety in the fact that they, they anticipate never seeing these people again. I don't think that's right. Someone else? Yes, ma'am. Could you tell us who you are? Mm -hmm. Sandy Sundar Swartz from the University of Kansas. And um, I was wondering about those minimal, sort of minimal state chapels and um, how often they really do get used by two people of two different religious traditions at the same time and whether the incident that you talked about where the Jew wouldn't enter while the Muslim was praying doesn't happen quite a bit where people just go in and see someone of a, or walk by and see someone of a very different religious tradition and say, okay, well, some other time. I mean, I, th I think that's right, but I think that, and I think one of the difficulties, if you like, is also a matter of respect. Mm -hmm. Because I have to say, the day I spent with the chaplains recently, I, I was going between landside and airside, and so I, I went into the multi-faith space on airside at Terminal 3, and there were three lads praying, three Muslim lads praying. And so I felt that it wasn't appropriate for me to just hang around. So I came out, and, and I suspect that that will happen, is that people will not want to, you know, will not want to intrude. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, I, I think there is actually a respect element to that as well, um, that, that people may not feel it is appropriate for them to be in the same space when, when some of a, someone of a slightly different tradition or a very different tradition is obviously doing religion. And you get back to that difference between usage as to whether people go there to do religion, or very definitely, again, from the comments in the visitors, but sometimes people are just so happy to have found a quiet space, you know, away from the muzak, away from everything, just a bit of calm. And so there, is, there are these different user groups. Uh, but again, we know that from, from regular churches as well. It may also have something to do with the, the actual size of the chapels and the layout of the yeah. furniture and the pews, whether mm -hmm. people feel happy to share whether it's somebody in their own faith yeah. or a different I think, faith. I think that's right. I mean, the, for example, the, the, the space at Heathrow is very small. <laughs> it's a small square room, whereas the, 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 the space that in Amsterdam, uh, although it's one space, it's a large space, and I think it does allow for different things to be going on. I think you could go into one bit of that and not necessarily feel that you were imposing on, on 
on someone else in another area of it. So I think there is a, a, a space issue as well. Sandy, did you ever encounter, like if you were traveling the Lourdes in your research on Marian pilgrimage, did you ever encounter chapels in those kinds of places? Where at Lourdes? Yes. In the airports. On in the, the airports. Oh, in the airports. Using airports on the way to. You know, I don't think they ever did. Chapels seem to evolve into something for the airport community itself. So it's a question of who sees it as no place. That if there's, there's two very distinct groups of, of travelers to which it is no place, it is that, that liminal space, but for others it is that community. And, and it's like reestablishing that community center by having our place. And, and some kind of tension. No, I agree with that. Mm. No, I think that's right. And I say this idea of community in an airport is very interesting. Well, again, one of the things that the chaplains at Heathrow were saying is that it, because working in an airport is very, very much a community, and there's quite a buzz to working in the airport uh, for all sorts of reasons, that quite often one of the things they deal with is if one partner works in an airport and the other doesn't, that often what would shift, as well as just the buzz that some people get from working in the airport, uh, they quite often have to deal with relationship problems, partly because one person is in the community and the other person's out of it. So there is, yeah, there's definitely that idea of, of it being a special community. And as I say, I think that's why I would come back to that point that uh, I think often airport authorities, they're thinking partly of their, their throughput, their travelers, whereas the chaplains and the people who work there are thinking of the, the core community, that the people who, who work at them. The airport, and that I say that's that's what they refer to as the parish, is the is the people who work there because they're the constant ones. Constant Don't you think it's interesting though that increasingly now we're getting a move for airports not to be styled as no place, mm -hmm. but to oh, reflect the regional right. identity. That's and right. your your work at Glasgow Airport has some interesting stuff on that. But then 
noticing also, for example, in this part of the country, Denver Airport, yes, very, very absolutely. strong regional identity in the airport, mm -hmm. uh, and Native American themes and the architecture and the interior decor as well. I'm wondering whether as these airports, if, if that takes off and you begin to get more and more regional style in the airports, whether that may uh, influence what happens I, I think that's right, and I also think that perhaps some of the scholarly literature designating airports as non-places maybe hasn't, hadn't <coughs> come down <laughs> quite as much to, to see some of the, the, the rootedness that there, there can be. Anyone else? Yes, Liz, go ahead. Go ahead, Liz. <laughs> Could you speak up a little, please? I'm sorry, we, traveled to, we were in Paris earlier in the year, and we looked at a, a lot of the different churches over there, and this, going back to this idea of um, people respecting other people's faith is not such an uncommon thing, because you find that if you go into some of the bigger cathedrals mm. or the bigger churches, that if you want to sit down and have a quiet time in the church, you don't pass across someone in, in their row. You find a separate row. You give the person who is already there the space yeah. to continue their meditation or whatever they're doing. I, I think that's very good. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. I think that's it. Uh, Marion, thank you very much. Thank you. Karen, thank you very much. Audience, thank you for your attention. Good evening. <laughs>